good. All right, awesome. So uh, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, Skip, and thanks for letting me talk today. Um, this is really fun for me because I just kind of finished up my dissertation on these Malagasy gem snakes, but there's some ongoing work we're still kind of putting together for this group of organisms, and it's going to extend well beyond me in the Burbank Laboratory with future students. So um, I'm really excited to see kind of what is a, a lesser known group of snakes kind of become sort of hopefully model organisms for tropical genomics. <laughs> um, so let's just move on to the slide. So yeah, the questions I'm going to kind of be talking about today are something I'm always, I've always really been interested in for a really long time. So from my first experience in, in a lab at Villanova University, my first field work where I was vastly underprepared both with my clothing and my packing to go to the field to where I am here today. Um, my last trip in Madagascar in 2018 that Skip was actually on um, asking this questions about how biologic, biological diversity originates, how it's maintained, how did certain organisms get to where they are now, and what are the you know, external factors, such as their current environment, historical events, um, that cause these organisms to originate, to differentiate from other organisms, and persist through challenging conditions. Um, Sorry, my slides are lagging a little here. So this is a question that maybe I've been loosely interested in from a really early age, um, but it certainly has evolved um, to this point where I hope to use this type of information and genomic data to model and predict how species might even fare under future climate changes by kind of looking into the past and projecting this into the future. So these are really interesting questions about evolution and diversity that you can ask anywhere on earth. Um, but as you may have guessed from my talk title, my work today that I'm going to be sharing is um, focusing on the island of Madagascar. So this is sort of an island meetup or island theme. So I'm not going to tell you that Madagascar is a natural laboratory, um, but I'm going to start by saying that all islands are natural laboratories. And if anything, Madagascar also uniquely kind of shares a lot of properties with continental systems due to its size and a couple of other factors. So the reason I'm really invested in the island of Madagascar or interested in as in a system for answering these kinds of questions is because um, it's teeming with biological diversity. There's these massive in situ radiations um, and some of the highest level family endemism of any place on earth. So we can really hammer down in a place like this an understanding of how biological diversity originates and sort of what drives or maintains these patterns of richness across um, complex landscapes. And um, I focus on answering these questions using reptiles and amphibians. Uh, they're one of the largest terrestrial vertebrate masses on the island. Uh, almost entirely endemic. They respond really strongly to ecological gradients, but really I also study herps on this island because I really like them. They're really fun to find in the field um, and some of my favorite species on the planet Earth. So um, the island of Madagascar, as I mentioned, there's a lot of complex landscape features. We have a lot of species like this paradura up here that might be only endemic to things like the karst limestorm formations in the Singhi, but we might have other species like this Burkizia that can be found anywhere from the high plateau to some of the more lowland elevations. So a lot of range and diversity with species that both specialize or are highly endemic to species that have wide distributions that sort of span biological barriers or interesting ecoregion properties. So we know that globally climate was really unstable throughout the late quaternary and this historical period spanning the past 2.6 million years. Um, in this graph, I'm kind of showing that as time progresses from past into the present on the right, that climate sort of peaks at several discrete periods. And in between these periods, we have interglacials where, you know, temperature is dropping, things are becoming dry, things are shifting. Um, and, you know, often these climatic changes are strongly correlated with vegetative shifts and we can expect that species that are subjected to these sorts of conditions are gonna to respond um, to them as well in terms of their population size over time. So populations sometimes contracting when uh, conditions are unfavorable and then expanding once they become more favorable into these um, kind of like recently opened up regions. So these glacial cycles of the quaternary are sort of the paradigm for explaining a lot of the diversity across biomes globally. But um, even though these events are often invoked to explain these patterns, we don't necessarily have a lot of data across many, many species in Madagascar that shows that potentially these types of changes could be related to patterns of endemism and richness. And that's what I'm really interested in on the island. So we know that they left this signature globally. We expect on Madagascar, it's possibly the same, but we don't really have that hammered down in terms of 
discrete temporal periods as, or for particular species or their properties, but we know that climate change alone isn't going to determine how species trajectories could be altered. So in addition to being isolated from a long um, from mainland Africa and, and India for a long time, Madagascar also is really diverse ecologically. Um, there's things like coastal, lowland, montane rainforest, but a bunch of other habitats that maybe don't get as much press time that I'm really interested in, like the dry deciduous forests or the spiny forests in the south. And so um, a number of permanent and significant river systems as well. And so we have species that are sort of distributed in some of these regions, all of these regions, um, and, and you know this full range of diversity. And so one of the things I'm interested in is our species within these regions responding the same, our species that are across all these regions responding the same to these climatic changes. And can we kind of figure out why certain species may or may not respond in the same way? Um, this goes to say for not just these ecoregions, but also these massive elevational gradients that we can find across the islands. So we might find things like Madagascar growth is low, low that is found only in Ankarana, but other species like heterixalis might be found both at highland elevations and, and other elevations. And so this is another thing that I'm really interested in, elevation and then ecoregion properties and how they may interact with things like biotic characteristics of the species as well. And so the way that I examine this is I like to look across entire species assemblages. So instead of just asking a question, you know, why does this one species respond? I look across lots and lots of many populations that kind of comprise a pseudo community as I can across the entire island to kind of pull out these big patterns that are happening for Madagascar. So I, uh, I know I wrote that my talk was gonna be about snakes, but I can't really talk about the snakes in Madagascar without talking about some of the patterns that I found in the other herps on the island as well. So I wanna outline the model that I sort of used to examine this both with um, single locus and then eventually genomic and hopefully whole genome data now in the future, which is that we have populations which are these pipes independently that are not interacting with one another um, in terms of evolutionary history. And from time in the past, we have um, populations expanding at time TS into the present. So when we see changes in these pipe sizes, we see a population expansion event. And um, to kind of estimate the synchronicity or the coincidence and timing of, of these population size change events, I estimate this hyperparameter zeta, which can range from, range from zero to one, where one is fully asynchronous, so everybody's responding in the same way, to um, values that are closer to zero, which is every population is sort of doing its own thing. And so um, when we see populations kind of co-expanding with these really high values of zeta where everyone's doing the same thing at the same time, these massive population expansion, maybe island-wide possibly events, um, our hypothesis could be that if this time actually coincides with major oscillations um, throughout the quaternary where we have changes in vegetation, um, we expect this coincidence with the timing to be kind of related to these massive population expansion events. So everyone's responding to the same thing at the same time. Um, but we also can experience situations where we have these really low values of zeta closer to zero, which is um, highlighted in teal here in comparison to the pink, where each population is sort of expanding, but it's expanding at a different time. And the explanation for this asynchronicity is a little bit more complex. So populations could be responding differently to the same event just because biotically they're really different. Um, they could be different because populations are responding, but they're delayed due to predator prey interactions or other biotic interactions, or species could be responding to entirely different ecological events that aren't shared. And there's a, a number of other explanations as well that might relate to these differences. And so I actually examined this in, um, Lots and lots and lots of populations of herps on the island of Madagascar that span all these ecoregions, some endemic, some not. But one of the exciting things that I found was populations that were restricted to the eastern humid rainforest um, actually were highly synchronous in comparison to the super asynchronous signal that I found for everybody else. So the super synchronous, synchronous signal um, and the timing of that co-expansion event really highlighted the importance of this, this area as a place where populations compact, contracted and expanded during pe periods of unfavorable climate. So although this was really interesting, I wanted to look at this a lot more in depth and I wanted to use um, genome-wide estimates for a group of snakes on the island that I've been studying for a while now. So we used super dense population sampling to look at both population expansions, but also population bottlenecks, which is something I'm really interested in because um, population bottlenecks are a really good indicator of a population that's kind of could be on the verge of collapse or could be recovering. So um, 
<clears throat> so I focused on the, the gem snakes of the island. This is something that Skip focuses on these snakes from a sort of a different axis as well. Um, there's as many as 130 species of snakes. They're really ecologically diverse. They're really, really cool and interesting. Everything from this little bumblebee guy to this tiny, tiny ground snake on the right hand corner. Um, and so as a predominant snake group on the island, there's a lot of diversity with, that I could work with here. And we already kind of had studied and understood when they colonized the island, sort of how they expanded and colonized these different ecoregions during that time period, about 30 million years ago. So understanding the tempo and timing of their diversification and all the species units in this group, you know, allowed me to pick populations that I could then study for these co-expansion um, co -expansion events. Right. And so this was a huge amount of work. Um, I can't take credit for all this field work. Absolutely. Um, there was a re really amazing team in Madagascar, including people also from the US like Skip and people from the AMNH that helped me collect these many, many samples that made this, this field work possible, um, especially my team from my last few field trips. And so this allowed me to get this really great dense population sampling for something that's really hard to find for those of you that have ever looked at snakes in the field. Um, and so I, I kind of was able to then separate these two, uh, these many populations of snakes into two sort of groups, ones that were forest restricted and ones that were more generalist. So my hypothesis is that species that are gonna be more range restricted to things like forest, rather than being able to span multiple habitats should have responded maybe more strongly to changes in climate um, and precipitation temperature in the past than species that are able to kind of, you know, deal with more variable conditions and span these different ecological regions. So we had nearly 400 individuals, uh, 11 different species groups, and um, lots and lots of link SNPs to focus on this study and um, kind of parsed out 34 different populations from this larger data set and were able to separate these into, you know, less than half being forest and the other being more of these generalist species. So I sort of like summarize their ecological properties to be able to bin them in these different groups to make this comparison. And so what we found was, you know, nearly half of these species, but a little bit less, had experienced a really strong population bottleneck. And the other half of the species had experienced kind of a moderate or, um, or strong population expansion event. And so once we had determined these different population trajectory histories, I was then able to uh, kind of look at the coincidence and timing of these different groups. So populations that had contracted at the same time or populations that expanded at the same time. And so uh, my colleagues and I developed kind of a pipeline software for looking at this. So in the past, I'd use approximate Bayesian computation for, for um, uh, approximating my summary statistics that tell me about how synchronous this event was and the timing of that event and a couple of other interesting parameters. In this case, we actually were able to use the site frequency spectra to summarize this data, uh, simulate it using MS, and then finally train a max, uh, machine learning framework to kind of approximate these different parameters and create these prediction intervals that tell me these different things. And this you know, was one of the benefits of using genome-wide sampling is that I have a lot more power to actually use these types of pipelines and get much better uh, estimations of these different events and these different parameters that I can be really confident in um, in comparison to some of my single locus data. So this was really fun. And so what I found was that um, there was a much higher degree of synchronicity within these groups um, for both of these different types of events. We found that population, you know, I found, um, I estimated this comparable assemblage-wide synchronicity and expansion using both unsorted and sorted summary statistics. So a bunch of different ways of kind of examining the data and found that these population um, expansion events on the left in blue happened around 119,000 years ago, uh, uh, thousand years ago, and then a more recent population bottleneck across all these populations that had been contracting um, around 45,000 years ago. Um, so kind of one around the LGM, the other one within the last interglacial. And so this is really interesting because looking at the dated phylogeny of all sampled species of Pseudoxyrophenae using astral, um, we know that these snakes um, in the Pleistocene we had was a sort of a bad time for speciation, meaning that this is the biggest drop in speciation rates that we found if you examine sort of this graph on the, on the left. So we had this drop in speciation rates around the Pleistocene, and yet I'm seeing a lot of we also estimated a lot of species um, kind of originating during this time period. So here we see that the dynamics of the Pleistocene were very bad for a lot of species. Um, a lot of these species went extinct and we never saw them. Um, the species that are alive today, um, 
you know, survive this period, but many thrive. So these dramatic changes produced a lot of new species. And we also know that these dates were before the major extinction events on the island. So about 5,000 years ago, the island of Madagascar was sort of just teeming with this diversity of large bodied endemic vertebrates like giant lemurs, enormous elephant birds, um, giant tortoises pictured here next to Chris Braxworthy, one of the members of my team. Um, and by 1,000 years ago, these populations had suffered extreme bottlenecks. Eventually, they went extinct. So coinciding with the extinctions, we know that humans colonized the island. So this is a couple of different examples of uh, you know, species population sizes that sort of dropped off right after this red line started up when humans colonized that habitat. So recent evidence indicates that these species, you know, experience these huge stretches of extremely unfavorable conditions. So these populations were already kind of on the brink of a bottleneck. And then, you know, this coincided with human introductions and then that caused the collapse. So it's not just human introductions, but kind of how species might already be, you know, pre-adapted towards a bottleneck or extinction event before human activity. And this is really controversial in Madagascar. I mean, I just read a paper last week, which was more evidence that it's actually all human introduction and not related to climate change. But I'm hoping to kind of provide a more biological and not just geological uh, piece of evidence showing that actually, you know, there might have been more complicated for some species that may have actually also suffered bottlenecks due to changes in climate due to historical factors in, um, you know, coupling that with human introduction or maybe not human introduction influenced at all. So I'm still kind of looking at this and, um, you know, my future directions with its work is using whole genomes. So that pipeline I introduced earlier, PTA, actually has the ability to harness the power of entire whole genomes to look at whole genome co-expansion and co-contraction. So I'm really excited for, for examining this in the context of this previous work. So we have five, um, you know, relatively high coverage whole genomes available already for Malagasy gem snakes which I'm really interested in, one of which is Langaha, which is one of my favorite species. So I'm really happy about that. And so just kind of looking at the earliest work with Domerg in the past, which you know I have log number of loci, so he's right there at zero because this is a morphological study to where we are today in 2021 with whole genomes from Malagasy gem snakes. I didn't fit this curve, but I'm hope kind of exponential, just showing that we can take something as kind of cryptic as a Malagasy gem snake and kind of use it in the context to understand evolution on the island of Madagascar in a kind of a really fun way. So things happening really rapidly and really, really quickly. So I'm going to look at co-expansion on the entire, uh, on these groups of snakes to capture the entire population history with just in, uh, single individuals for most forest and non-forest species. And then my future work will also have the opportunity to build on this foundation by leveraging this power in comparative genomic analyses to identify species and populations of conservation concern um, and illuminate possible mechanisms of speciation. So kind of looking at genomic islands of divergence. So understanding how species diverge, but also what prevents them from coming back together when they occupy you know, the same geographic regions. They're not separated by geographic space. It's what is kind of keeping them apart at the genomic level. So these whole genomes will also kind of give me the chance to look at that. So I'm also looking at things like population uh, demography and divergence with these, these snakes as well. And so uh, just in conclusion, I, I hope this talk kind of gave a sort of snapshot of what I'm really interested in my bigger research program, which is taking things like individuals and their genomes and looking at um, things at that level, but pushing this towards the species level and then ultimately the assemblage and community level. So we're not quite operating at the ecosystem um, portion of this triangle, but hopefully somewhere kind of in between the two different tiers. So taking whole genome data, understanding why species kind of diverge um, and don't come back together, but understanding also how their historical demography and population size change contributes to that population divergence and ultimately species diversity across the entire community. And so um, because I currently have hold of the screen, I also get the chance to say, you know, to talk about one of my colleagues, Skip, who is hosting today, who for those of you that know him, know he may not always love people, but I have been to the field with Skip and I can prove here from my Skip and see you photos that it is animals and field works that make Skip really happy. And so I got a million chances to see him smiling when we did field work together. It was really fun and I appreciate his contributions to this project and the sampling. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues who have contributed to this work. This um, doesn't even begin to thank them for all of their help. And you know, I'm currently at the University of Lethbridge and I'll be working on something a little bit different that kind of pulls in a lot of this this foundational work and understanding of evolution and populations to uh, work with endangered salamanders. So um, whoop, that's my last slide. So um, with that, uh, if there is time, I can take questions, but I, I may have gone over. <laughs>
I think we can take a couple of questions. Um, that was an awesome talk, Ariana. Good job. And thanks for embarrassing me with those photos. Um, uh, so if anybody has any questions, you can post them in the chat or uh, first come, first serve, speak up. Um, and we, can, we have time for a couple for Ariana. Oh, I had a question, Ariana. <laughs> yeah. So when you're doing the um, PTA, mm -hmm. I noticed like in the skyline plots, there seem to be some species that a single species has undergone over the course of the last however many million years, it's gone undergone expansions and contractions. So like, yeah. can a single species in your study, like could a single species have been included in both like the expansion data set and the contraction data set? Or do you just choose the most recent or? Yeah, work? no, that's that's a great question, and that's so. Um, this was done using stairway plots. I can, I might not be able to like pop back to it without lagging everything, but I was done using stairway plots, and so it's still with rad seek data, which, as you know, even though it's better than maybe single locus stuff, there's still a little bit of fuzziness with the resolution, especially when we push towards the present or push too far into the back. So um, even though I'm showing the entire plot, there's only sort of a, a discrete period that the authors. Um, and other studies have shown that you can kind of be more confident in your results within this time period. So kind of pushing the limits of the resolution of RADC data to estimate population demography and changes in population size change, and then also restricting it to the period that I wanted to ask a question about. So although, you know, you may have had a bottleneck during time X, if it's beyond the region of sort of the quaternary, then I'm not going to ask about changes that happen outside of that. Um, and even though, yeah, so, um, so within that, um, it's still a really big buffer. And then some of my data sets actually apply this buffer when they're sampling um, from my different summer statistics and priors to kind of work with that. And so that's one of the reasons I'm interested in looking at these whole genomes because I that actually will show, you know, in a much more fine scale way where these changes happen. And that I'll actually probably have to play with populations being in both data sets and how I'm going to handle that is going to be a little more complicated. Okay. Um... Again, great talk, Ariana. I think to stay on track a little bit, we're going to move on to the next talk. So if you want to stop sharing your screen, and Jim, you can okay. start sharing yours. Um, it's like, Jim, good chance to get his screen ready. And I'll just briefly introduce him while he's getting ready. So uh, Jim, for the Calicad crew, Jim should not be uh, uh, a stranger. Jim is a professor and a curator at the uh, American Museum of Natural History. Um, UC Berkeley and the curator of herpetology um, at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. Jim did his PhD at UT Austin with David Canatella. And uh, anybody who knows Jim knows that uh, Jim's Ballywick is Indonesia, right? So he's the uh, leading expert in Indonesian phylogeography, phylogenetics, and comparative phylogenetics. And this man loves Draco lizards, flying lizards, a cute little guy on his lead slide. And uh, Jim was also my PhD advisor when I was at Berkeley. So I learned a lot from this guy and uh, I'm really excited to see what he's done in the time that I left. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jim and I'll beat myself. Um, and other people, if you can make sure that your computers are muted so we don't have any interruptions, that would be great. So uh, take it away, Jim. All right, thanks, Skip. I hope I don't disappoint you in terms of the progress I've made since you left. <laughs> I've been working on this system for so long. I, I know there's some people in the audience as well that, uh, that have seen me speak about this even quite recently. So for those of you who have already seen me talk about this system uh, recently, you might want to get up and grab a donut or do something uh, for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, it's great to be here, really happy to have the chance to speak to, uh, to, to this audience about this work that I've been uh, undertaking for a bit too long, actually, on the flying lizards of Sulawesi. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. So, um, you know, so Skip mentioned to me that this was this, uh, the theme here was islands and genomics. And so we'll start with the island. The island that I'm going to be discussing today is Sulawesi. Uh, Sulawesi, again, is an island that's within Indonesia, uh, illustrated here. Hopefully you can all see my pointer. Um, it's a large island, the 11th largest island in the world. It's about a thousand kilometers from one end to the other. Um, kind of like Madagascar, it operates like a small continent in some respects, although it's not as big as Madagascar. Um, the island has been isolated for its entire history. Uh, it's never been connected to adjacent continental land areas and uh, it's about 25 million years old. Um, and so consequently, the almost everything out there is 
uh, endemic because it all got there by overwater dispersal. Um, and I'm interested not just in, in, uh, in identifying this, you know, the diversity of Sulawesi, but also trying to understand how speciation has happened on the island. Uh, we're not going to have a, much time to talk about that today, but the island has a really complicated tectonic history that, um, you know, it was, it's comprised of multiple paleo islands that merged. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we see a fair amount of in situ diversification on the island. Anyways, this is Wallace's line, the red line here, which separates the continental landmass of Greater Sundaland, including Borneo here, uh, from Sulawesi. It's also separated from Sahul uh, by deep water. So the, the island, again, is famous for its endemism. And, uh, and these are some examples of sort of showcase Sulawesi endemics. Uh, my favorite's the Bobby Rusa here in the middle, but the most interesting I would say is probably, are probably these macaque monkeys, which actually represent a small radiation on Sulawesi. There are actually seven or eight species of macaques on Sulawesi. Um, and they are distributed, as you can see, by this little jigsaw puzzle here of ranges. You know, they're parapatrically distributed. So they, they're each endemic to their own, you know, small sector of Sulawesi or in the case of this one, the uh, Bhutan Island and its, uh, and its satellites. Um, and so, you know, when I first got it, when I first went to Sulawesi to collect flying lizards, mostly so that I could fill in a larger uh, phylogenetic study that includes all the Draco species, which of which there are about 50 and they're all over Southeast Asia. Uh, the system that most intrigued me were these macaques because nobody really looked at phylogeography or, or even, you know, you know, biogeography of reptiles and amphibians on Sulawesi and it was, curious to me whether or not such a pattern with lots of regional endemism was likely to be the case for other taxa besides the monkeys. We really didn't know, you know, at the outset, but it seemed likely, I mean, if you have multiple monkey species on an island separated into these various quadrants, there's probably, it's probably going to be similar in, a, in, a, in other organisms. And of course, there was no good explanation for why we see this, um, this pattern. And uh, that was, of course, something else that, that I've long been, been interested in. I'm not really going to talk about it today, but we've definitely made some progress there. The group I'll talk about today are the flying lizards. There's a monophyletic assemblage called the Dracolineatus group. Um, that's the subject of today's, uh, today's talk. And this assemblage includes nine species. Three of them are on Sulawesi proper. Uh, I refer to them as morpho species because they're morphologically homogeneous, but discrete from one another, these three lineages. But then there are an additional six species that are found on islands surrounding Sulawesi. Uh, and I'll show you the ranges here in just a moment. So the, the sum of the assemblage is nine species, three of which are found on Sulawesi proper. Um, the three on Sulawesi are Draco spilinotus. It's indicated here by the, the sequence of orange dots. Those are collecting localities uh, that are incorporated in the genetic studies that, I've, that I'll be presenting to you. Uh, the black dots are Draco walkery and the green dots represent Draco bakari. So at first blush, you might think, well, you know, there's three species of Draco on Sulawesi, not quite as complicated, not as many species as we see with the macaques. Um, and so, you know, maybe the macaques are, are, are kind of a one-off or, or, you know, unique in that regard, but we'll come back to this here in a moment. Uh, the other six species are again, uh, found on these satellite islands surrounding Sulawesi. And you can see that they exhibit a fair amount of morphological variation. Um, uh, that distinguish them from the ones on the mainland and from one another. These are all males uh, that are indicated here. So, of course, if you if you collect some genetic data and try to get a handle on what the on what the uh, the genetic diversity is on Sulawesi, what we find is that there's actually a lot more going on than we can see just on the basis of the morphology. Uh, and in fact, you know, we have these nine species that are currently recognized uh, within this Dracolineatus assemblage, but a primarily mitochondrial phylogeny. This is a six gene phylogeny, but most of the signals from mitochondrial genes for almost 600 individuals indicates that we have actually here um, 18 clades rather than nine. And, uh, and 12 of those clades are present on Sulawesi proper, and the other six represent these peripheral isolate species that I mentioned before. Uh, and so you can see that there's tons of structure here. And in fact, you know, there's with 12 on Sulawesi, you know, it's at least possible that the situation is actually a little bit more. Um, uh, sort of rich in lineages than we see with uh, than we see with the macaques, uh, and so the you know first thought is well maybe these the all of this genetic variation that we're seeing on Sulawesi might represent a bunch of cryptic species um, for, uh, among these three morpho species that we see on Sulawesi. And if you actually look closely at the tree here, you'll see that you know the three morpho species on Sulawesi, Walkery and Spilinotus and Bakari, none of them are even monophyletic, right? Which is also a suggestion that 
we might be looking at multiple species here within each of these morpho species. So this was something I was really interested in, in sort of teasing apart and, and further evaluating. Just, I also want to point out that the, the mitochondrial divergences that we're seeing here are, they're pretty deep, right? I mean, so consistent with what we might expect if these things really are operating as independent species. So the, you know, the, the sequence divergences uncorrected at the ND2 gene, you know, range from 5.8 to 15.8%. And so if you corrected them, they'd be even deeper, right? So these are deep mitochondrial divergences, you know, deep enough that we could really be looking at species here. But of course, we can't just rely on mitochondrial data to make inferences about species boundaries. And so it was important that we, that we, uh, that we have a, a richer sort of genomic perspective on this, a nuclear perspective on this beyond the three sort of slowly evolving genes that I screened to begin with that I mentioned before. So the way that we went about doing this, so we've, I've actually done a number of things over the years, but the, the, the latest, I guess, was to, was to use an exome capture approach to try to obtain more of a phylogenomic, population genomic scale data set for the system. And um, so exome capture, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a, a targeted sequencing approach. Um, in our case, we began with transcriptome sequencing. So we did we we sequenced transcriptomes for four Draco individuals representing a few species. Um, we aligned the annotatable exons to anolis. So we only wanted these genes that we could annotate, so we knew what they were. We wanted single uh, single copy genes to the extent that we could could assure that we would have those. And then we we lined those things up and we and we selected as targets for a bait capture approach, an exome capture approach those exons that exhibited at least two variable SNPs. And at the time, we didn't really know what we were going to get out of this. I mean, we, we didn't know if, if, if we really would just have a couple of SNPs per locus, which wouldn't be that informative for, for phylogenetics, or whether there might be more variable sites there. Um, and in the end, it turns out that the markers were, were a fair amount more variable than we, than we even really expected based on our, our, our criteria. And we didn't accept exons that have more than like, you know, I think 15 SNPs. So we wanted to try to make sure we weren't getting paralogs while we were at, while we were identifying those markers. So we ultimately used um, an Arbor MyBates in solution capture array to screen 313 Draco samples in seven outgroups. But that's for all of Draco. There's about 50 species, and we were screening all of those. Um, but we also um, we did about 100 that are relevant to this story today about this Draco lineatus group, and we screened them for 1,600 exons representing 709 sequence loci. And uh, then for reasons I don't really want to get into, we just we needed to ramp it up a little bit. And so we added 540 lizard specific UCEs to sort of complete the data set. So they were part of our exome capture array. I'll refer to them separately from the exome capture markers, but they were part of the same capture array system. So the, so the total uh, was you know, about 1,100 loci for the, for the full data set. The exome data are a little better, I think, than the UCE data. We ended up with about 200x coverage for those um, for the exome targets, uh, the concatenated alignment for those, since this is a genomics audience, about 765,000 base pairs, 683 retained loci. Uh, the mean locus link was 1,120 base pairs, which is pretty nice if you're going to be doing some kind of species level phylogenetics with, uh, with these data. Um, and there were a lot more SNPs than we kind of initially anticipated, about 440 SNPs per locus. But that's across the whole data set for the 50 Draco species, you know, in the op groups. Um, the UC markers, about 150,000 base pairs, 367 base pairs uh, for the mean locus link, about 52 SNPs per locus. And you can see the, the sum total of the data, you know, a pretty good data set for trying to do some phylogenomics and, and population genomics. So we were really, inter I was really interested in trying to figure out, you know, how many species we were really looking at here, and whether or not the mitochondrial, uh, the, these mitochondrial clades actually might represent real species from a genomics perspective. And the first thing we did was looked at genetic structure uh, within the system, and so we did this, you know, with three primary approaches. We used structure, the program structure. Uh, we run, we ran analyses using the, you know, all informative SNPs and also using individual single SNPs per locus. Um, you could do it with the linkage model with all informative SNPs. Um, also use this BFT star, um, which was not very conservative. <laughs> Always maximize the number of lineage of inferred lineages. And um, we used BPP version three as well, which is a species delimitation program um, that allows you to use full sequences. Um, and you know, I would I would say that I feel like the structure analyses were the most useful out of these three, and that's primarily what I'll talk about from the standpoint of uh, of the the. The clustering results. I think more importantly is that we also did some population demographic analyses of the of these data. 
uh, using a program called GFOX. And for those of you who don't know GFOX, GFOX is a coalescent, a coalescent population genetics program. It's built on the machinery from MCMC Coal. Um, and like IM and IMA programs that are maybe more familiar to the, to the audience, uh, it allows you to estimate some sort of critical population demographic parameters like theta, the effective population size, time since divergence, and migration rates. And you get these unscaled values. And if you know something about the, the mutation rate, then you can convert those to what I'll call real world values, like an actual effective population size, an actual number of migrants per generation, or an actual, an actual time since divergence. We don't really know the mutation rate, but the rate that I use for the analyses I'll be presenting to you is 1 times 10 to the negative ninth, which I think is in the ballpark for this group based on other information that I can ha I'll happily convey to people in the question answer session if they're, if, uh, if they're interested. So um, let's take a look at what we see with, uh, with each of these three morpho species on Sulawesi now. Um, uh, according to the structure type analyses, you know, there may be two or there may be four lineages within this Draco spilinotis assemblage. Structure, you know, two, three, or four. Structure didn't see, you know, didn't see a lot of lineages within this assemblage, but the other methodologies that, that I was looking at, including using like RAXML phylogenetic inference, suggest that in fact there is, you know, there are four clades four groups, four clusters uh, within this Draco spilinotis group. This is the one that's the most ambiguous, I would say, um, in terms of the results. The sequence divergence values, the uncorrect that are here, 12.1, you 10.1, know, and 5.8% divergence. And everything's kind of coming together here near the Gorontalo depression. There's another 7.6% split between these uh, spilinotis lineages as well. I think that the, the GFOX results are most compelling here um, because the GFOX results suggest that each of these uh, clusters diverged quite a long time ago. So these are, you know, 6.7 million, 6.3 million years ago, 7.3 million years ago, 6.3 million years ago. And, uh, and more importantly, the number of migrants per generation that are being passed between these, uh, these clusters, you know, is really low. So um, there's a lot of debate in the literature now about using coalescent methods for species delimitation. And from my own perspective, it's really important to get a handle on actual migration between these, you know, putative lineages, and uh, and so I've used GFOX in order to do that. And uh, and basically, for for theoretical reasons, we think that if there's you know anywhere from 0.5 to one migrant per generation, if you're assuming a completely neutral process, then you might expect these populations to to uh, to uh, to merge. Uh, but if the number of migrants per generation is less than that, then it's pretty reasonable evidence that these things actually are. Um, you know, operating as independent lineages. And that's basically what we're seeing here, right? So you can see very low, uh, very small estimates for the numbers of migrants per generation being passed between or migrating between these, these lineages. So the, my inference here is that it looks like four species. I mean, you know, whether we need to hang names on all these things is an open question, but it looks like four lineages according to these analyses. Uh, in the case of Draco walkery, we had five mitochondrial clades, and you can see that they're quite divergent from one another, at least some of them, you know, over 15% divergent. Uh, but when we actually uh, analyze this, um, say using structure, um, what we find is that it looks like there really aren't five clades here, that there are really three, and that some of these things actually are, are really not distinct from one another, three or four, depending on how you, you want to look at it. Uh, and when you use structure in this data set, first thing that happens is you get two groups and that distinguishes these, otherwise these, from the others. And they're obviously super divergent. And so, you know, for those of you who are familiar with structure analysis, sometimes if you have a really divergent split within the group, that basically overwhelms everything. And then you need to run separate analyses on the resulting clusters. And what we find is that, you know, so there's this deep split, then there really isn't any structure separating these things, despite the fact that they have a 15.6% uncorrected mitochondrial split within them. Um, and then for these three, uh, you know, it, it looks like these two are in the process of merging. And I'll show you another graphic on this, you know, in a few moments, but they're 6.2% divergent. Uh, and then 7.7% here. And these ones are in fact always found to be, the Southwest is always found to be distinct. So looks like three lineages here, according to the structure analyses. Um, GFOX uh, also infers three groups here. Uh, and you can see that the divergences are old. The numbers of migrants are, are also um, are, are pretty low. And so it looks like we're, we have three species in this assemblage if, uh, if our analysis is, is legit. And then the third group is Draco Bakari, where we see three mitochondrial splits. Again, so the 6.2% break here, a 10.5% mitochondrial break that sits right on this Lawanopa fault. 
Uh, when we look at the results using structure and other methods, we basically find that there's no signature of any sort of genetic break across this Lawanopa fault where we have a 10.5% mitochondrial break. And so, you know, in this case, it looks like there are two lineages instead of, instead of the three mitochondrial clades that we identified. Um, and GFOX basically uh, results in the same sort of interpretation. So if you do a GFOX analysis across this break, you just get you get nonsensical results, which is what happens if you try to, to infer um, uh, these sorts of uh, parameters or, or, pro or this sort of process when there really isn't a, a genetic break. So you end up with, uh, with tiny effective population sizes for the tips, super huge effective population sizes for the ancestral node and migration rates that are you know, sort of through the roof. It basically treats them as a single panmictic, uh, panmictic lineage. Nevertheless, this one, the smaller mitochondrial break does seem to be correlated with a cryptic species boundary with very few migrants per generation and a 6.3 million year split according to those data, which is a good, um, that 6.3 million year split and the other ones that I've just showed you are all fairly um, congruent with what you also see with a, say, uh, you know, a star beast time tree analysis of the, the same data. Okay, so the, the outcome of this is that it looks like we have, um, you know, not nine species in this assemblage, but also not 18 species in this assemblage. It actually looks like there are 15 species in this assemblage with multiple cryptic species within each of the Sulawesi groups. And now it's been sort of recolor coded to show that. And, you know, there's lots of interesting things to do here to try to understand um, how speciation has happened on the island and resulted in this sort of pattern. And it's definitely tied to the, the complex tectonics of Sulawesi. Um, for a full length seminar, I would talk about that, but uh, today I'm not gonna talk about that. Instead, I'm gonna turn my attention to these examples where we have deep mitochondrial splits, but they don't actually seem to be lineage boundaries because that's kind of weird, right? For most people, that's kind of weird. How do you have a 10 and a half percent mitochondrial break that's not a species boundary or not really any kind of boundary? And we see two key examples of this, this 10 and a half percent split again, which you know, according to the genomic data, the exome capture data, there's no barrier to gene flow here. And yet this mitochondrial break is maintained. And a similar thing is happening up here where we have a 15.6% mitochondrial break. Our sampling is not quite as good in this one. I'm gonna spend more time talking about this system, but you know, it's a similar sort of problem. Like, gosh, how do you maintain a mitochondrial break like that when there's no barrier to gene flow according to you know, a, a, a nuclear data set that's sampling presumably randomly across the, the, uh, the nuclear genome. Interestingly enough, so the, so the interpretation here is that these things have merged, right? I mean, so one possibility is that they were, they were diverging in allopatry and they started to diverge and then they came into secondary contact and when they met, they merged, except that the mitochondrion got hung up for some reason at this, you know, this prior interface where these things came together. And the only reason why we know that anything interesting ever happened is because the mitochondrial data are continuing to show this 10 and a half percent mitochondrial split. If you're only looking at nuclear data, it's like, nope, nothing to see here. You just have one lineage. Same story up here. Now, it turns out that in, in within Draco Walkery, this little cluster here seems to be showing how this probably played out because it looks like it's still an, in, an, un, uh, you know, an ongoing process. So we have CC4 here and CC3. They're 6.2% divergent. I've collected the two within a couple hundred meters of one another when I was trying to figure out where the interface was between these lineages. What we see when we look at the exome capture data, which is what we're seeing here, is that it looks like there's this sort of ongoing process of conversion of the whole thing to blue, right? To the blue. So you have all this admixture that's that's uh, that's that's uh, proceeding. It looks like you know along this uh, along this interface. And so if we wait long enough, my interpretation of this is that we probably would just see you know blue, you know green will be gone, and it'll be the same story we were just looking at with Draco Bakari and with Draco Walkery up here, where we have a mitochondrial split still retained in the system, but no genomic signature of anything happening. So that's my take on it. Um, so how do we explain, uh, how can we explain the maintenance of a mitochondrial boundary in the face of gene flow, like complete gene flow uh, in the nuclear genome? Well, there are a few different ways that we could, uh, we could explain this. And I'm sure that many of you are probably already sort of thinking through, you know, in your minds like, okay, um, one possibility is sex bias dispersal, right? Usually when I query people about this, when I explain the system to them the first time, that's their, that's their answer. Like, how could this happen? Well, maybe, you know, the males are moving and the females aren't, and you wind up with these mitochondrial splits being retained for that reason. Uh, 
it's certainly possible. Seems hard to imagine that it would it would last for so long and and um, uh, and why it would happen in just these instances. But I think another possibility, which I've indicated on the slide here, um, is more compelling to me, which is the possibility that there might be mitonuclear and Dzansky Mueller incompatibilities in this system uh, that are maintaining that mitochondrial boundary there. So what do I mean? I mean, not everybody knows about these, you know, DMIs, but this is a, these, first I'll tell you about the typical sort of DMI system, which is not really necessarily involving a mitochondrial gene or mitochondrial genomes, but just, you know, regular old nuclear genes. And so the, the way that these Dzansky Mueller incompatibilities work is, you know, in theory, you've got an ancestral population, as you can see here, we'll just talk about the version on the left. Uh, and in that ancestral population, they've got a couple of genetic loci that maybe interact with one another. They're separate loci, but they, but they, maybe they code for some gene that's involved in the same protein or whatever. And so, uh, and so you wind up with, um, or the same structure. So you wind up with, you know, you have these, maybe in all of them, they have little a, little a, and little b, little b. They're co-adapted. They work together to perform some function. Population splits. Now they're evolving in isolation. And maybe over time, you know, some amino acid replacement substitution, some things happen within the, within this A locus uh, that cause it to differentiate from the ancestral locus. And uh, whereas in population two here, nothing's really happening at, at little a. Uh, and so over time, this eventually becomes big A, big A, little b, little b. And A and B are still co-adapted, everything's fine. Uh, in population two, maybe the same thing happens in, in the inverse, but with B, where little b, little b changes over time into big B, big b. It's still co-adapted with little a, so everything's fine. However, if you bring these two populations into secondary contact at some later date, suddenly big A is seeing big B for the first time. And it may be that they don't play well together. And if they don't, you can wind up with hybrid dysfunction. Um, you can see dysfunction in F1s and especially in F2s as you start you know, recombining these things. And so the, that's the basic theory about the Zansky Miller incompatibilities is you, know, you wind up with these genes that are no longer co-adapted, can't work well together. Uh, and it can result in speciation, but it doesn't have to be speciation. In the in our system, it could be um, it could be something a little bit different, which I'll explain in a moment. So you can imagine that mitonuclear incompatibilities might be even more likely than just you know a couple of nuclear encoded genes having uh, expressing this relationship, because mitochondrial genes evolve really quickly, and uh, you know the functional mitochondrial organelle is based on hundreds of genes but only a small subset of them are coded on the, encoded on the mitochondrial genome and the rest are in the nuclear genome. And that mitochondrial genome, you know, we all know it evolves much more fast or much more quickly than the, than the nuclear genome. And so consequently, you know, the basic, uh, our basic understanding of how things work is that we expect that the nuclear genes that are interacting with the mitochondrial genes to create a functional mitochondria probably are evolving compensatory changes, trying to keep up with the accumulation of mutations that happen within the mitochondria. So you could imagine this scenario where two populations split, the mitochondria starts evolving separately, nuclear compensatory changes are happening in genes like the OXFOS pathway that are part of the functional mitochondria to maintain functionality because the mitochondria, of course, is critically important for the function of the animal. And, uh, and over time, you, know, you have this divergence. And then if suddenly you bring two lineages into secondary contact and you stick one mitochondria in another nuclear backdrop, you might have a problem, right? Those compensatory changes aren't there and, and uh, you could wind up with mitochondrial dysfunction. That's our basic theory about how this might work. Uh, and that could result in a, in a full-blown speciation event where the hybrids are inviable, you get reinforcement and these things are no longer interacting. Uh, but it's also possible that they, um, you know, in this case, it could be that a few nuclear genes might get hung up along with the mitochondrion while the rest of the genome is allowed to continue um, merging. So that's our basic working theory here is that, you know, here we have our interface in Draco Bakari. Greens have the Southeast mitochondrial haplotype. Yellows have the, the East Central Core uh, haplotype. And at this interface, you know, it could be that the mitochondrion is hung up. That we can see maybe some nuclear genes that interact with the mitochondrial genes are also hung up at that same spot. And the rest of the genome has been, has been allowed to, to merge. Uh, so that's that was that was our basic theory, and so we decided to test this by developing another capture array um, using the same sort of system, a MyBates array. But in this in this case, we screened 603 genes that are known to interact with nuclear genes that are known to interact with the mitochondrion, and that included the 90 genes that are in the OXFOS pathway, which is really critical to mitochondrial functioning. Uh, 
it's sort of the core genes in, in cellular respiration, but another 500 or so genes that are also known to interact with the mitochondria. And then we screen them for, for only 18 Dracos. So, you know, these 18. Um, the idea being to look for genes that show a similar boundary across this mitochondrial interface that we see with the, with the mitochondria. And I just want to mention that, you know, for those of you who've ever you know, tried to do nuclear gene phylogeography, you know, assuming these things really are panmictic, which is what the exome capture data says, they're all the same, we wouldn't expect to see much nuclear variation across that boundary, right? I mean, nobody would go looking for a protein coding gene uh, you know, exons to, for phylogeography studies across a system like that. You'd be going to introns, the most rapidly evolving markers you could find, and even in those, you might not see much variation. So we thought that if we see anything really going on across this boundary, that that's a pretty good indicator that something, um, something interesting might actually be happening. So we looked for genes that, um, we looked for SNP variants in these 600 genes uh, that were sorting with high frequency with the mitochondrial haplotypes here. So, you know, most genes we wouldn't expect to show any variation, right, given the, this sort of panmixia idea. Uh, but we were looking for some that might show uh, a boundary there. We used ANCs to do that. We used association tests to look for those. Uh, we didn't find any genes that were reciprocally fixed for alternative allelic states across the mitochondrial boundary. And, you know, we wouldn't really expect to find any because it's not a species boundary. It's actually, you know, we think there's still continuous gene flow happening across that boundary. We really think that the action here would just be a few, a few genes that might be hung up along with the mitochondria, and most of them wouldn't. And in fact, we did find genes that are that do show SNP variants that are highly correlated with the mitochondrial boundary, much to our surprise. So they're the top 12 SNPs when we do this angst analysis um, are either amino acid replacement substitutions, nine SNPs in six genes or they're synonymous changes that are linked to those. They're in flanking regions uh, or they're synonymous changes in those same six genes. So we found really six key genes at the top of the, that were most correlated with this boundary. Um, uh, and, and they had uh, nine amino acid replacements or, or 12 amino acid replacement substitutions, which was a little shocking. And the genes include uh, a number of genes that are part of the oxalose pathway, plus some other genes. And those are indicated there. And this just gives you a sense of what the what the uh, what the the allele accounts look like for those, and you can see that you know there's a strong correlation with the mitochondrial boundary, but not a perfect correlation with the mitochondrial boundary in those genes. So, um, and we found a bunch of we, when we look at the top 50 hits, we find some additional ones as well. And so, in the end, there were 16 amino acid replacement substitutions out of these 600 genes, mitochondrially interacting genes, uh, that were that were correlated with this mitochondrial boundary, suggesting that they might be part of a dobzhansky muller incompatibility there. Of course, you might be asking yourself, I'm almost done here, you might, be, you might be asking yourself, well, is this just what you'd expect to see no matter what genes you were looking at? And so, you know, we wanted to look at this um, in the exome capture genes as well to see if there were other just random genes that showed amino acid replacements that were also correlated with the boundary here to get a sense of whether this was an unusual finding for any gene or whether it's really, you know, you know, if these are really candidates for dobzhansky muller incompatibilities. And we found in our exome capture data set, you know, the 709 gene data set, that there were four amino acid replacement substitutions among the top 50 angst hits. They weren't the highest hits like we saw with the other data set, but there were some, there were four of them. But these four amino acid replacement substitutions in some respects are the exceptions that, that, uh, that prove the rule because when we look more closely at them, what we find is that three of the four are actually mitochondrially interacting genes that happen to be embedded within our exome capture data set, sort of just by chance. And two of those are oxalose genes. And the fourth gene was a gene of unknown function. So, you know, it could even be another mitochondrial interacting gene. So what we see in the end is that, you know, when we looked at 1300 genes, um, you know, the top 20, so we identified 20 amino acid replacement changes associated with this mitochondrial break and 19 of those 20 were genes known to interact with the mitochondria. And, uh, and one, was a gene of unknown function. So, um, so it looks like there might be something going on there. Um, I know I'm going over, so I'm just going to stop talking at this point. But, um, but I'll just mention that you know the the next phase for us very quickly. The next phase for us is to figure out if we can test whether or not the amino acid replacement substitutions that we've identified are actually important for mitochondrial function. And there are various ways that you can do that, including using like you know cybrids. That's maybe the most exciting. Uh, um, approach to do that, where you can take the mitochondrion from one cell line and, inter and introduce it to uh, 
an alternative uh, nuclear backdrop and vice versa and ask whether the mitochondria and the nuclear genomes don't work well together. The exact thing we're, we're trying to evaluate here. Uh, so I'll stop there. Sorry I went over a little and, um, and I'm happy to just unshare my screen and, uh, and give Katie her chance to speak. Awesome talk, Jim. Um, we have time for one quick question. Sorry, I missed the warning. Sorry, uh, is anyone else in line? I can't find the hand raised button here, but I would love to ask one quickly if I can. Uh, really cool stuff. So I was curious if you've thought about on the on the Klein you see in the other population, if there's if you've thought about doing a Klein analysis, like to see if among the genes that are introducing or not introducing you have kind of like a sharper Klein in these mitochondrial oxfos genes that you're seeing than in the background where you say you see them kind of generally creeping that blue population expanding and if maybe that rate's slower for oxfos genes. Yeah, what a great idea. Um, no, I haven't done any Klein analyses. I've definitely thought about Klein analyses. Um, I think that, you know, for that one, for the one um, uh, contact zone that where, we, where you see that that admixture sort of extending across the, the range of CC4, um, we don't have the Oxfos data set for those, right? So we did our first, you know, we did a capture for just basically the Southeast, um, you know, the, the Bakari populations, but I do intend to do that for all of these things, because I think that if these dubzanski mueller compatibilities are really relevant here, they could be underpinning the, the cryptic speciation events as well as these failed speciation events. Um, and, um, and it would be great to look at that in, a, in that sort of format using a Klein fitting sort of, uh, sort of approach. We have genomes now for a bunch of these, uh, but still it's just for the focused on Bakari at this stage, but my long-term plan is to do that for all of them. And so great, uh, great suggestion. Awesome, thanks again, Jim. Um, so I'm gonna briefly introduce Katie. So Katie got her undergraduate degree from uh, Ohio State University, um, went and did a PhD at the University of Alaska Fairbanks where she worked on uh, systematics of uh, Madagascar uh, Tenorex, which are cool little hedgehog convergent mammals related to elephants. Um, and now she has a postdoc with David Ricework, David Rice Rock at my institution, the University of Kentucky, working on the phylogenomics and population genetics of lemurs and tiger salamanders, two, two study systems I think of at the same time. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Katie and uh, you can take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Skip. Um, yeah, as, as Skip said, my name is Katie Everson. I'm currently at the University of Kentucky in Dave Weiss Rock's lab. Um, I'm going to be talking about some work that I've done on speciation and gene flow in Madagascar's mammals. Um, there it goes. So I don't think I actually know a lot of people here. I was expecting to see a lot of familiar faces, but actually I'm not seeing too many. So I'm glad I'm sort of starting with this slide of um, sort of just introducing myself and what I'm interested in. So I sort of think of my own interests in terms of three questions. So the first is sort of how do new species form in the face of gene flow? Um, I prefer non-model systems because I think they're more fun, but um, this, an example of sort of asking this question is this paper that we published in MP&E in 2019, um, thinking about this group of birds called thrushes. And um, in this system, some are migratory and some don't migrate. And sort of what does that do to gene flow and speciation in that complex? Um, I also think a lot about how landscape and ecology shape the speciation process. So uh, an example of this work is just a couple weeks ago, we got a paper published in PNAS on um, the recent diversification of the tiger salamander complex. This is a group of salamanders where some metamorphose and some do not metamorphose um, as adults. And so how does that affect their speciation and also um, the landscape that they're living in in central Mexico? And then the third question I think about is just because we are in this age of big data, um, how can we best leverage that to document species um, and particularly in biodiversity hotspots like Madagascar where um, the, the need to document species diversity and biodiversity is particularly urgent because there are a lot of species on these, um, in these systems and yet the habitat is disappearing very quickly. So I'm working on um, my postdoctoral research is on Madagascar's lemurs, 
I was hoping to share a little bit of that data today, but I don't think it's quite ready for prime time. So instead, I'm just going to be talking about um, my dissertation work at the University of Alaska Museum. So that was on, like Skip said, the evolutionary history of Madagascar's Tenrex. Quick shout out to my advisor there, Link Olson, who obviously laid a ton of the groundwork for this, um, for my dissertation. Um, and if you've never heard of Tenrex before, that is okay. Not a lot of people have heard of Tenrex. They're awesome though. So Tenrex, if you have heard of them, you've heard of them as this example of convergence. So along this top row here, I'm showing a shrew, a mole, and a hedgehog. And then on the bottom row, these are all Tenrex. So there's a Tenrex that's called a shrew Tenrex, and a Tenrex that's called a mole Tenrex, and a Tenrex that's called a hedgehog Tenrex. Um, but because this is sort of a phylogenetics crew, I know that it's okay to put a tree up. Um, so this is where it's, it's really cool is that um, shrews, moles, and hedgehogs, they're sort of in the section of the tree that, I'm, that I put here on the left. So they're actually more closely related to us, like humans, than they are to Tenrex. And Tenrex are um, in this group called Afrotheria that includes the elephants and the aardvark, a bunch of weirdos. So their Tenrex are a really cool example of convergence. They live, of course, only on Madagascar. Um, and so when they arrived on Madagascar, there were all these open niches, shrews, moles, and hedgehogs didn't occur there. Um, they arrived somewhere between 35 and 55 million years ago on the island and um, radiated and filled a lot of different niches. So I just really like this picture because it shows a few different species and the way that um, Tenrix really did sort of radiate and, and from the very, very small shrew Tenrix that weighs only two grams to the much larger Tenrix caudatus, the common tailless Tenrix that can weigh over two kilograms. Um, they really have a lot of, uh, a huge range in body sizes and shapes and even colors and, um, and in ecomorphology. But interestingly, the shrew Tenrix um, have a lot of cryptic diversity. So part of this is just a practicality thing where it's hard to study something that's really small. So um, this is, there are 21 currently recognized species in the genus Microgale. 11 of them are shown here, obviously around a penny. So they're very, very small. It's hard to tell these guys apart. Um, 10 new species of shrew Tenrix have been described just since the 1990s. So they're sort of in this state of, of species discovery, um, even still. And so I figured I'd keep it short, which I think was a, a good choice today, and, and just talk about one of my chapters. Um, this chapter um, was published just in 2020, so last year, and it was published in Molecular Ecology. It's on speciation and gene flow in um, just a small clade of shrew Tenrix. This publication has not gotten any citations yet, but I loved it. It was such a fun, small study, um, but we did a lot with this small group that we were working with. So just to introduce sort of the players in this study that I'll be talking about, um, they all belong to a very small clade that on this tree, they're down at the bottom. So it's just three species, microgale sauracoides. Um, that means the etymology of that is just the shrew-like tenric or the sawtoothed tenric. Um, microgale footsie footsie, which is a really cool name. It sort of roughly means white or pale in Malagasy. And it's a reference to, they have um, very white toes. And then Microgale Nazului named after famous Malagasy mammologist Nazulu. Um, so these are the three species that um, are closely related to each other. And there are a few reasons why I wanted to sort of look at this system in the context of speciation and gene flow. So one of those reasons is because of their geographic ranges. So microgale sauracoides and microgale footsie footsie, you'll notice have very, very similar ranges on Madagascar. Um, we have no idea how they're partitioning their niche space. If they're partitioning their niche space, it, they, on a single trap line at a single locality, you can find microgale sauracoides in one trap and microgale footsie footsie in the next, um, but almost identical geographic ranges. I'll just point out if I can annotate um, that there's a small area in the far north of Madagascar. Um, this is Amber Mountain, if you're familiar with the island, where um, only microgale footsie footsie occurs and not microgale sauracoides. Um, but otherwise, very similar. Microgale nazului is a pretty rare species. It only occurs in some um, isolated parts of the dry forest on the western side of the island. I actually won't talk too much about them. 
But so the other reason that this is sort of an interesting group to look at is because for a long time, we've been collecting mitochondrial DNA from as many tenrics as we could get our hands on. So going to museums and um, any time that we were able to get a crusty or um, any sort of a sample off of, off of a museum specimen, um, get a little bit of that DNA and just grab one um, mitochondrial barcoding gene. And what we were seeing in the bark or in the mitochondrial phylogeny for this group was very clearly two clades of microgale footsie footsie. And the one clade that is showing up here as sister to microgale nozulii, it's restricted to only the far north of the island. So um, microgale footsie footsie appears to be uh, non monophyletic. So we started to think about sort of a few questions in this system. How many species are there? Um, are they morphologically distinct from each other? And also, is there evidence of gene flow among these species? So we used UCEs. Um, I think we already talked in a, in a previous, one of the seminar speakers, forget who, talked about UCEs already. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. So it's ultra conserved elements, um, just sort of the standard tetrapod kit. And we, gathered this UCE data set from a subset of the individuals that we had the mitochondrial data for. And we found that um, contrary to the mitochondrial data, microgale footsie footsie was actually monophyletic. So microgale footsie footsie, the north clade and the south clade are sister to one another. There's a huge caveat here though, and that is that we weren't able to get UCE data from the one individual of microgale nozului that we had. We were able to get the mitochondrial data and a few nuclear genes, um, but it was too fragmented to really do the UCE pipeline. So with respect to microgale sauricoides, um, microgale footsie footsie seems to be monophyletic, but um, microgale nozului is, is in there somewhere. We're not totally sure where. We did start to wonder though, um, with that huge caveat, is there evidence of gene flow in this system? So with a, a system where you have um, four species on a species tree, the outgroup and then microgale sauricoides and the two clades of microgale footsie footsie here, you're able to do an ABBA-BABA test. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Basically, it's just a way of testing um, whether there's evidence of introgression either between microgale sauricoides and the south clade or microgale sauricoides and the north clade or neither. Um, and so what we did find is um, a significant result indicating that there may be introgression between the, the south or the more widespread clade of microgale footsie footsie and microgale sauricoides. Not totally surprising given that they have such an overlapping geographic range. Um, we also used Frapple. I don't know how many people have, have actually used this program. Um, I know it, it had some attention when it first came out and then I, I haven't seen a ton of papers on it, but I really enjoyed using it. Um, it's this uh, R package where the basic idea is that you simulate data under a variety of models. So um, these are the 16 models that I used here. You simulate data under these models and then you compare your empirical data to the data that was simulated and use AIC to determine um, what's the best fitting model here. And so when I did that, there was one model that came out far and above as, as the best model out of those 16. And it was this one. Um, it's showing, again, um, this evidence of introgression or gene flow between microgale sauricoides and the south clade of microgale footsie footsie. Very cool. Um, I love when everything works out the way you sort of expected. Um, but on the other hand, um, I found this pretty interesting that we included another model that microgale footsie footsie, the north and the south clades, we included a model where we also allow for there to be gene flow between those two clades. And that model was rejected pretty decisively. And so um, this to me seems like evidence that the two clades of microgale footsie footsie are reproductively isolated. So there doesn't seem to be gene flow, at least today, going on between the two clades that are currently considered a single species. Um, we did look a little bit, I don't want to talk too much about morphology because this is a genomics um, seminar, but we looked at, at morphology and there was one trait that came out as significantly different among all the different species, but it, also between the north and the south clades of microgale footsie footsie. So when you hold these two um, 
when you hold an individual from the south clade in your hand and an individual from the north clade in your hand, you can tell a difference based on tail length. And this is the closest that we were able to get to identifying like a diagnostic character that might indicate something that could help um, a field biologist in Madagascar be able to identify which clade this, this individual belongs to. So again, pretty strong evidence that there should actually be two species here of, of microgale footsie footsie that are currently considered that one species. But I, I will point out that we used 48 different measurements. So from the cranium, from the post cranium, um, external measurements, and tail length was the only trait that was significantly different and non-overlapping between these two clades. Um, they still appear very similar. And in fact, we, we use a machine learning R package called Random Forest. Um, if you're not familiar with this, Random Forest, basically um, you can give Random Forest all of um, all these different traits and Random Forest will try to classify um, the different individuals in your data set into species by those traits. And in our case, we actually had an error rate of around 5.5% where it had a really hard time distinguishing between the two clades of microgale footsie footsie. But one of the things that I, I just sort of liked about this, this whole study was I felt like it was a really interesting way of, of um, thinking about the speciation continuum. I know not everyone likes to imagine speciation exactly like this figure, but I think in this case, it was a really um, apt metaphor where we see this example of the two clades of microgale footsie footsie that appear to be sort of early on in this process where they're reproductively isolated, but there are few morphological differences between them. And then this other comparison of the, the microgale sauricoides and the south clade of microgale footsie footsie, where they actually have very large morphological differences. Um, in our morphological analyses, which I didn't show a lot of, um, those two clades or those two species um, fell out very strongly. And microgale sauricoides is always significantly larger in body size and a few other traits are, are quite different, but it appears that there's some occasional gene flow there. So I just thought this was an interesting way to think about it. And I'll just close with sort of the significance of continuing to work on Madagascar's mammals and, and on Tenrix in particular. This is a pretty out of date table at this point. It's from a 2005 Oryx paper, but just I'll draw your attention to the line that says non-volant mammals. Um, so it shows that this is still true today. 100% um, of Madagascar's terrestrial mammals are endemic to the island. So everything that's all of the terrestrial mammals that are found on Madagascar are only found on Madagascar. And that's pretty startling, you know, when you think about how more than 40% of Madagascar's are already gone, primarily due to Tavi or slash and burn agriculture. And uh, so if we lose them here, we lose them everywhere, right? Um, I will, at this point, just give a few acknowledgements. So uh, thanks, huge thank you to the Bahatra Association. So Steve Goodman, Bwangi, Marijan, Ashil, and all their grad students. Um, these are the folks who are doing the bulk of the sort of boots on the ground um, survey work and inventories that have resulted in data that were acceptable for genomic work um, from the last like 30 years. And then all the natural history museums that we got samples from, and of course, all the folks who helped with the UCEs and the